socially, uh, socially positive social alternatives to incarceration and punishment. In, in a word, I mean, you could talk about it all night, but in, in a word, there are positive community-based community, positive community -based alternatives. So, what do you think about movement building, about the issues of racism in this period, about what we need to think about as a community that will move us forward, that will challenge the injustices? Well, how does it resonate with, the, with your interests and your work and your thinking? I'll say a comment about what you're talking about, the parole uh, scheme uh, kind of resonates or echoes something that Alexander Solzhenitsyn said about the, the prison system in Russia. They would wait expectantly for the parole hearing, go in, get another 10, and they're supposed to just go back and wait for 10 years. <coughs>
I, you know, in my life, I, a lot of you know, I've been doing this work as long as I can remember. It was the first person that ever stood up for me publicly in a group. And I really appreciated it when you did that because I've never had to happen to you before. I love you for that. The thing that happened at this group, <clears throat> um, I don't knock anybody for what their religious is. You see what I'm saying? I get along with everybody, I try it. But it just so happened this Muslim guy came <clears throat> and he was talking, you know. Making suggestions and stuff. They were nice at first, and I was trying to really give it the full understanding. Okay, I still think. Well, everything was going fine, right? And I understand when he said, let's spend our dollars in our own community to help build our community up. That's okay. I understand that too. But don't tell me I gotta take my bag of money that I don't work for and I can only spend it in black stores only. Where do you get that from? It's not right. And how can I look, my guys uh, and Leslie and every how can I look y'all in the face if I go and do something like that? Then I started fussing because Leslie didn't get the full understanding of it. <laughs> And they had these buses and cars, you know, going to take us to these places, right? Well, I didn't show up. Then when I found out she came, I said, you ain't had no business there either. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> My God, so he even took, I was so heated. I was talking to him on the phone and the tears was in my throat. I was upset. I really was. And I have a bad heart. I do. I had a triple bypass, but I can't help it. You strike my nerve, I'm coming out because you're pushing me up in a corner and I ain't no punk. <laughs> you gonna tell me. He a little, he a little, a little sour, right? He said, well, Miss Shell, he said, maybe they didn't make, oh, yeah, see, in the hell he did me. He meant just what he said because he came out of his mouth, didn't he? Yeah. And I didn't show up. And about a month later, now this happened about, how long ago about that? When I was in October. Mm -hmm. I showed up when? Was that uh, about two I weeks ago I came I to a meeting? March, February. And that I came because they called me. He called me. Oh, Miss Hayes, we miss you down here. We need you. I didn't say nothing. So he told me to come to the meeting, and I came to the meeting. And so he said, Miss Hayes, I heard somebody told me that you, um, you didn't like that last meeting that you was at, and that's how come you ain't show back up. I said, yeah. I said, but the thing of it was, I ain't hiding. I just had to find the time when I can get down here and sit down here and talk to you sensibly to tell you what's on my mind. And he said, well, Miss Hayes, he said, I didn't know. He said, but well, he ain't here no more. Yeah, Miss Hayes ain't here no more either. You see what I'm saying? Because that shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. That's not what we're trying to have. What we're trying to have is people working together. I don't care what color it is. You see what I'm saying? Now, as long as we're going to put that dividing line in there, we ain't going to get nowhere. We ain't going to get nowhere. And if they don't know that, then they don't need me to tell them that because I ain't going to tell them in a nice way. <laughs> so, you know, I just sit down and just, you know, mind my business. But when they step on my toes, I'm coming out. I'm coming out of that corner. You're going to get off my toes because it hurts. I got bad feet. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just, uh, just the word, I guess, uh, I've talked to David about this, uh, but just the, um, the concept of being an ally uh, opposed to being involved. I mean, I, um, those who are the most oppressed, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make a critique, but I guess um, the, the sense that I get is if, if white people or males don't identify themselves as being um, not just an ally, but an active participant in their own liberation, that, um, that 
it's, if, if people feel like, you know, um, it doesn't actually hurt, like, because the way, like, the same way that, like, uh, exploitation is happening all over, like, to people of color, to women, to the environment, um, to workers, it's, it's like, it's, it's similar. And that you know it affects us all, and it's not a good thing. So if, if we, if people continue like on this like idea, like oh, uh, somehow like they're like it's like their life is better. Well, of course it is, but um, it's I just don't feel like we we can't we won't be able to move anywhere. Um, I just feel unless unless people who are in a privileged position recognize it, and it's not actually it's not it's not good for us. It's not good for anybody on earth, and it's actually really detrimental. And that the system uh, is, is is a really it will kill everybody. And if, if I just, I, just, I guess when I hear ally, I hear like I don't feel like an ally. I'm fighting for myself too. I'm not just fighting for others. And, and not that I'm not fighting for others, but I'm fighting for anybody. You know, and it doesn't it doesn't make me uh, it hurts me like <laughs> when I hear people get hurt. Um, you know. And yeah, so anyway, that's what just some thoughts of mine. That, Thank you, Nick. Did you repeat that? What happened? Just looking at that, we shouldn't have to still be fighting for what we fought 60 years ago. Yeah. Um, some of us in this room, uh, on uh, Dr. King, on the anniversary of Dr. King's death last week, um, stood. And um, we were reading the, his uh, speech that he did in um, um, against the war in Vietnam that he did on April the fourth of the year, exactly one year prior to his, his murder. And um, you know, it was like it was like present day, wasn't it, Chuck? It was like it was like that could be read today. That exact same speech mm -hmm. could be read today, and not one iota has been changed in in reality. You know. Uh, there were, we, instead of using the word uh, Vietnam, we all read the speech and it was 15 pages. It took about an hour to read. And um, <clears throat> we all read to turn to reading it out loud. But there were, uh, instead of saying, um, when he, Dr. King had written um, the war in Vietnam, he was saying Afghanistan. <coughs> and that was the only difference. The wording was identical to what the struggle is happening today. And so, um, 60 years later, 40 years later, I mean, it's still, um, even though we struggle and we struggle, and yes, we have made some changes, yes, we have come forward, but um, it just seems like, uh, um, well, there's just some, well, yeah, there have been some things that, that I thought I would never see in my lifetime that have happened, um, but there's still so much to fight and struggle for. We must not be, um, we must not follow suit on mm -hmm. what, what we don't, we don't hear much of are things like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What we hear is, uh, in addition to celebrity gossip, what we hear about is the, the Trayvon Martin killing, which, which is important. It, it is bringing up uh, important issues uh, in the society. Uh, but there's a, there's a lack of urgency I think, compared to the 60s. The 60s, there, there was electricity in the air. I mean, we were all, we were all motivated. I mean, we were, we were all very active. Am I, am I right? <laughs> you tell me. And there just seems to be such a complacency these days. Because you all recognized it wasn't normal back then. Say that again? I said it's because you all recognized it wasn't normal back then. Yeah, yeah. That's the first struggle we have to get through today with young folks. Yeah. I mean, I, I worry. I, you know, uh, one of the few things worry me. Where, you know, where are the great black leaders that, you know, who, who have replaced the, all the great black leaders that we had in the '60s? I overheard two uh, uh, black men uh, a couple of years ago. I don't know. They must have been in their '30s or '40s. I was at a restaurant, and they were mentioning that the the black teenagers today wouldn't wouldn't know Malcolm X, you know, uh, if you if you put them a picture in front of them. It just seems to be a lack of. I don't know if it's if it, it's not if it's interest or motivation, but uh, television's more or less prolific. 
it, and back yeah, there now. Yeah, and, the and video games yeah. and, and, and uh, cocaine deals and, and blacks shooting blacks. I mean, it's terrible. So I, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, somebody has to get mo get get things going, <laughs> to motivate us, because there just doesn't seem to be uh, enough. I don't know what the word is. I keep thinking maybe urgency, but, but uh, we have, we have to get pumped up. We have to get ramped up to do to do things, and. Uh, a lot of what's going on really worries me. As I said, the, 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 this excessive coverage of the, 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 the Trayvon Martin shooting, uh, which I, I you know, fully believe deserves a fair amount of coverage. But, I mean, this is, this is the major thing we've heard, you know, about what's going on in, in the black community or the black and white community. And we don't hear of anything else. I mean, it's, I think it's really pathetic. It's, 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 it's that kind of stuff and celebrity gossip and TV stuff. And uh, it, it seems to be worse than ever. So I'll shut up now. I'll say the drawing was fine. I was just saying there's two things. He was doing good. One of the things is yeah. a lot of people didn't realize, but City Hall pulled black history out of the schools. Uh, I'm not surprised. When you go and ask, a young person on the street who's the Black Panthers, yeah. they don't know exactly. who you're talking about. Exactly. Who is that? You know. Unless they don't get in this class. Yeah. yeah. And they said, they <laughs> told the teachers that Black history is not important for the children to learn. Who but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Okay. It I was know. okay to keep teaching them about Christopher Columbus, right? Uh, I don't know. Everybody know what he was, right? I don't know if City Hall did that or not. Yes, they but, did. They did. Um, I've been out of the loop for a while, so mm -hmm. I can't even speak to that. They did. But and that's you know, my kids were small. It's up to teachers and parents to make sure that the children get this information. But it was true when I raised my three children. There was a lot that was not being taught in the schools. So they got it at home, so that they were prepared when they went to school to handle whatever might come up. They were teaching the teachers sometimes, <laughs> and got in trouble for that, and I did too, but I'm used to getting in trouble, so that's, that was no big deal. And um, when I started teaching in 1969, they did offer black writers and black history in the high schools. What did you just say? 1969. They had started teaching it in the high schools of Buffalo two or three years prior to that. When I started teaching in the high school, I was at Lafayette High School, they offered um, African American writers, African American history. They were both electives. So you chose that. You, either, you didn't have to take it, but if you wanted to, it was there for you to do. And teachers received no um, in servicing to get that information. It was like, okay, you're going to teach this, and you're going to teach that, and you, and you, and you, and that was the end of it. So there was no end servicing. They were electives. They were half credit, and they had great books. I was just coming into the knowledge. So that first year that I taught at Lafayette High School, the man who was teach I taught English, and the man who was next door to me who was teaching African American writers, he let everybody know. He didn't want to teach it. So I made it known that I wanted to. I knew about that much, because I was just getting into it and just beginning to understand it, but that's what I wanted to teach. And just like he let everybody know he didn't want to teach it, I let everybody know I did. I was told that because I was a first year teacher, I couldn't do it. And in the second year, I made sure my students knew I wanted to teach it. So they staged a sit-in. In Lafayette High School. They sat right on the steps, refused to go to classes until I was guaranteed that I would be the one who would teach it. And, you know, it happened. It was 19, what, 70, 71 when that happened. And that September, I got it. I taught it until they said, City Hall, mm -hmm. now as you say that, there were not enough people choosing black writers of black history. I had people sitting on the windowsills in my classroom, so I don't know about the other classrooms and the other high schools, but they said overall, not enough people were choosing to take black writers in black history. I mean, I was studying things the night before in order to teach my students the next day. 
And in order to teach the literature, you have to know the history and the music. So I was studying everything. I was fired up. I started teaching believing, stupidly. I was naive. But I could go in, like I said, you know, kick a door in. I did hang my red, black, and green flag. And there was a red, white, and blue flag in the classroom, too, as there were in every classroom. But there was a poster in my classroom that showed an American flag and a black hand with a match underneath it. To this day, there are young people who are parents and grandparents who swear I burned the flag in room 319 in Lafayette. There was a picture. I wouldn't have done it. They didn't know about the 11 X that I referred to earlier, but um, they swear I burned the flag on 319. I did not. Just a poster, very fine poster from Scholastic Books. It wasn't something I drew. It was a very fine poster. I did have my red, black, and green flag hanging in the room. I did wear my head wraps and my long skirts. I was told that I couldn't do it, please. There was no dress code for teachers unless a principal said so. He didn't like me, I didn't like him. So that was the end of that. He wasn't going to tell me what to wear unless he was going to buy my clothes. That's what I'm talking. And what I was wearing wasn't nearly as important as what I was attempting to teach. And it was what I wanted to teach. I wanted desperately to teach it. And I mean, I have students now, black and white, who remember those days. And we were all excited in the 60s, we're going into the 70s. What about these days? Is, is any of that going on? Well, we, have a, we have a stack of folks that are waiting to speak right now. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Starting <laughs> on the left side of the room here, this gentleman's been waiting for a while, and then Heather, and then yourself. Yeah, this brought back a lot of memories from those times. <clears throat> I was in Michigan, though, and it was really in the And, the and, the and uh, there were different times, and they're useful. Um, you know, it's, it's history to some people. It's, some of us kind of lived in it. And there's no use in recreating the situation. A lot of stories. There was a lot of things going on. There was anti-war, there was civil rights, and there was drugs. Um, and they all kind of got intertwined. Those, that situation probably would have been created again. And the thing about the war is we were terrified for our lives. We were frightened, particularly men. There were strangers who wanted, this is Catch-22 for real. These are strangers who wanted to kill me. And I had to do anything I could to save my own life, anything I had to do. So one of the lessons that in the last 50-something years I learned, because I didn't learn anything the first 15, <clears throat> A couple things stick. One is a phrase that says, if I am not for me, who will be for me? If I am only for me, what am I? If not now, when? Which means that I think, as you said, we need to advocate for ourselves and stand up. We have to stand up. Not just insight, but action. The second is, our responsibility is not just to ourselves. We cannot accomplish as much individually as we can collectively. And if you don't do it in your lifetime, you hope your children will do it, or your grandchildren will do it. You know, I was 1965 in, in Montgomery, Alabama, between murders, and thought that would end racism. A couple thousand white college students coming down to it. I was back in Montgomery, Alabama last year, helping with tornadoes. I'm not sure what's different. Because we cannot complete the task of repairing the world does not mean we're not obliged to start it. These ideas are good, thoughts are good, insights are good, stories are the only thing I have left. Action is critical, solidarity is critical. There are lessons to be learned from all of these movements in what they didn't do right. I watched Martin Luther King steal the stage from Jim Foreman in Montgomery, Alabama, SNCC. <laughs> we are temporary heroes. 
I watched the evolution of voice to SDS to the weather underground, and you know that that wasn't a model because of the way people treated each other. We watched the same thing happen in the black community. If we want to study them, study what way, ways we can improve them. Why is it we have an Occupy Buffalo downtown and then a splinter group, and you wonder why there's not enough power to, to give it staying power, to give it political power? Our divisions <laughs> kill us. We get deluded because we have so many things we want to do. They're all very good. But the only way for us to make a difference, if not for us, for our children, and if not for us, then their grandchildren, is to do it together. Is to emphasize what we can do together and let the rest go a little bit. Otherwise, there are never going to be enough of us. And it's not like the government has this great conspiracy. I really believe there's not enough collective intelligence in government to have. <laughs> Most of these are just fuck-ups. They're just accidents and dumb mistakes that people then say, oh, wow, that must have been why we get in that way. Okay? But we can do things together that we cannot do alone. And uh, I want to thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one of the things that hurts me is like the sentencing that these people are getting. Um, so the reason is that children are getting like 75 years. Very well said, right? And like in the past few days, like I've heard about like all of these um, people who have been defending the earth and um, like getting 20 years and they don't hurt anybody, they're just hurting property or whatever. And it seems to be that like the sentencing comes from like a place of fear. And like, oh, you know, you're challenging Monsanto, you're challenging these corporations, so we're gonna give you, you know, twenty years or whatever. And so like David Gilbert getting like seventy five years is like, wow, what's the threat there? You know, and the threat it seems to me is like going against what the system is really trying to do. Like the system tries to divide people based on class, gender, race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like working together in solidarity to end the systemic oppressions that they're trying to push seems to be like the biggest, you know, threat to them. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention is, this, like, in terms of leadership, like, we don't really have any leaders right now that's, like, really prominent in the United States. And I wonder if that's, like, from a place of fear. Um, because of all of these, you know, well, if you go against, you know, corporations, you, you know, throw bricks into, you know, bank windows or whatever, then you're going to, you know, go to jail and so on and so forth. And, you know, all, all these different, you know, um, and, and people just don't know, like, what to do. Like, how do I really make change? And so I do think that it does come from, like, being a part of the community and really being together and, you know, working through all of those divisive measures that they've placed on us. Um, and just working together. And um, part of the, the work that I do um, relates to like identity, like the know who you are and where you came from, and it also comes from like um, my work is also like with families and preservation of families, um, because so often like families are ripped away from each other, and that's another part of um, of keeping people separated. Because if you create trauma right in the family, then you're not going to try to access your history or you're going to try to, you know, latch on to, like, the identity of the oppressor, essentially. Um, and then you're going to fill up that void with, you know, buying stuff and, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's just so important to have, like, community and just to work through all of those traumas and all of those divisive measures and to just, yeah, be, like, work together.
I just want to kind of pick up and agree on what you said. Challenging the powerful is the worst crime, maybe unforgivable. But I want to talk about black history. It's slavery is white history. The murder of Fred Hampton is white history. And, and Gilbert talks a bit in the book about community control of schools. And Bell Hooks mentions that one of the, maybe the downsides of integration was the kids got pulled out of black schools where they were taught, being taught, you know, wise up to the situation they were heading into, and put instead into white schools where they were lower class and you know, pushed aside. Can I get back? Good evening. Mm -hmm. I was working, so I got here late, but uh, I wanted to touch on a few issues. The one he said about black on black and um, why you don't have no leaders. If a person looks inside itself, we are leaders, right? And another thing, the system, you can say to you, the system makes, makes us do what we do. Like the young lady was talking about, if you do this, you won't get this time. You know, if you're afraid to struggle and afraid to step to the plate, stay on the porch. You know, because these days, I, I was born in 63, and I was born to respect my elders. I don't care shade, color, I don't care what you was. I was taught to respect my elders. I had two, two Caucasian families living on my block, born in Bedford-Stuyvesant. A lot of Spanish and you know, Latinos and blacks. And if they seen us out of pocket, they're going to put that rod to you, take you to your house, and then your mom's going to put the rod to you. See, they, so now, when a, when a parent tries to admonish their child, they'll call the police on them. And when they call the police on them, they're going to take the child from them and lock the parent up. You know? So, um, I just want to touch on that. When you talk about the leaders in the community, and I came to Buffalo in 2009, I was asking, Different, different groups about uh, 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 communicating. Communicating is key in anything in life. But nowadays, you don't even know who's who. You don't even know who your neighbor is. You know, you don't even help a person shovel their snow out the driveway. You don't, you know, I say, I go across the street, and I, what you doing that for? Because that's what I was taught to do. I mean, what, there's something wrong with that? I don't care who, helping an old lady cross the street, helping with their bags, you know. When you, when, you, when you reach out and do things like that, you might see a little child, you ask them how much is so-and-so, so-and-so. How much is three times three? And they give you, you give you reward them, you know? Just like you reward a dog. When the dog do something good, you give them a biscuit. You know, it's just really no difference. It's just that our mindsets is messed up. You know, our mindsets are for a person to tell me I can't go to Lovejoy, or I can't go, I, I can't go to a different part of Buffalo. I said, I go anywhere I want to go. Oh, but you can't go. I'm going wherever I want to go. If you tell me to come somewhere, I'm going to be wherever I want to be. And that's just how it is. But a person has fear. When she talk about fear, a person is scared to do certain things. Because this is going to happen. Well, it's going to already happen anyway. You already mark. If you ain't a rough child, a Getty, a DuPont, a Kennedy, you already, you already mark. It, 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 it don't have nothing to do with, 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 with complexion. You, you, you ain't a 1%. So you, 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 we all together. We're all in the same pot, and what they do is they'll throw some at the community and they'll suck it right up. They'll throw some over here and they suck it right up, and then instead of not thinking that we're all in the same boat, so what we got to do is step up to the plate and start talking with each other, communicating. You know? Because for a person to tell me I can't come to go see Nate, I'm going to see him, wherever you at. It, does, it doesn't matter to me. You know? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as we stand for the same purpose, the same aim, same goal, like the sister said about religion. I don't talk about to you, to your way, and to me mine. As long as we gonna get this, whatever, whatever the uh, whatever the job is, we gonna get it accomplished. That's the main goal, me. I don't care, cause everybody have a part to play. You know, everybody have a part to play. Um, Peyton Manning, he can't win a game without his receivers or without his line. So we all got it, we all have a part to play. And that's just leave it like that. You know? Because I've been around some good guys. David Gilbert, extreme, extreme intelligent. Jalil, you know, yeah, extreme intelligent. A lot of a lot of good leaders is locked up. Women, 
and men for what? For speaking on the truth. And they got a think tank. And, and if you don't know, every 40 years, it's a think tank. That the powers that be do, they go in their little, little tank or whatever, and they put, it, to put together, um, for the next 20 years, what we gonna do? Uh, yeah, we gonna put drugs over here, and we gonna, yeah, let the prostitutes stay over there, and, and don't mess with them. You know, election, you know election time, but you know we gotta clean up the streets, right? We gotta clean up the streets, but um, after that, let's finish doing what we're doing. You know, and like far as curriculums. I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, but I went to a public